Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon and good evening. Welcome to Lazy Road Talk. Happy Sunday. Um, I was going to do this program last night, Saturday night, but I ran out of time. Once I, um, you know, go deep into trying to find all the information related to Wang Huning, and I just couldn't stop. There's just so much information uh, to cover. So um, I'm glad that I spent more time on that. But so stay with me. And with the daylight saving, <laughs> I think I could need another hour. Uh, it's actually, it feels like nine o'clock in the morning, but um, I'll do my best. All right. So the two sessions, uh, which are China's People's Congress and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, have been concluded, right, on, on the 11th. And they are Chi CCP's biggest political show because of their um, rubber stamp function. At the two sessions, Xi Jinping was re-elected as the th uh, president of China for the third time. He got 2952 votes with no opposition or abstention. Uh, another official who got elected is no other than um, the protagonist here. Politburo Standing Committee member Wang Huning. The reason his appointment to, to this, I mean, people generally know, knew about um, his, his appointment, but the reason why his ascension to, the, to lead the CPPCC, which is Chinese political, Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, is getting a lot of attention is because of um, the role he will play uh, in the Taiwan affairs. Last fall at the party's 20th Congress, three out of seven Politburo member, uh, Politburo Standing Committee members were at the age of 67, not yet old enough to retire at the, um, the, the, the threshold or the theor theoretical retirement age of 68. But Xi Jinping only kept one of them, and that's Wang Huning. Nikkei Asia's uh, Kazuji Nakazara wrote in January that Beijing realized that one country, two system, the one country, two system game no longer works for Taiwan. For Xi Jinping, he needed to develop a new platform and he appointed Wang Huning for this task. So after the massive pro-democracy protest that erupted in Hong Kong in 2019, Beijing enacted the so-called national security law, putting an end to the promise of one country, two system, two system. And the fall of Hong Kong alerted Taiwan. Public opinion changed dramatically, um, and and the real election of Tsai Ing-wen and her DPP, uh, Democratic Progressive Party, you know, it confirms that. So Wang's role, I think Wang's role maybe more than drafting just a new framework to replace one country, two systems. The C CCPPC, it's always a mouthful to say, is known to be the cosmetic department for CCP with the goal to build external alliances and make friends. It manages the ministry of the United Front Work Department, which is the agency that builds influences through various means, such as infiltration. People say it's a spy agency without being given the name spy. Uh, Shi Taifeng, the minister of the United Front Work Department reports to Wang Huning. And Xi Jinping understands that relying on the military strength alone um, to take over Taiwan may be counterproductive. And plus the PLA isn't totally ready to, to engage in war with the United States. He puts Wang Huning, who has been the CCP's ideological guru for decades, in charge of re-strategizing Taiwan takeover because a softer approach through means of a, a cognitive or a information warfare is is what the CCP does best and costs less. And specifically, dismantling the sense of, and um, dis dismantling a sense of, what do you call that? Animity from within the opponent or the enemy, and therefore paralyzed its defense, is always the focus of the United Front Work Department. And CCP always see this type of work conducive to military operation because it knows 
winning on the battlefield uh, in a military confrontation with the United States will be difficult. And also, Wang Huning is the deputy director or vice chairman, the, the second in command of CCP's Taiwan Affairs Work Group. And this is a new group that Xi Jinping established in recent years. And he is the, the head, the, the chairman or the director. So therefore, Wang Huning is the most important person managing Taiwan affairs for Xi Jinping uh, within the party. So who is he? Well, he has, he has been given many names. Some Taiwanese media call him the spy chief, even though he isn't the head of the intelligence. I think this is precisely because um, he heads the, the United Front, the United Front Work Department. And he came from academia and was the youngest professor at Fudan University at the age of 30. He's a political theorist. I call him a master of ideological propagandist. He started his political career by helping former CCP leader Jiang Zemin uh, solidify power when he needed the most. Some China analysts call him the Jiang Zemin's biggest spy, spy asset in Xi Jinping's circle. And, and, and also the force that turned Xi Jinping to the left. Uh, without a doubt, his influence on Xi Jinping is evident in that he masterminded a number of Xi Jinping's trademark initiatives, such as Belt and Road, The China Dream, Xi Jinping Thoughts. Washington Post columnist Hugh Hewitt called him the most dangerous man in the world uh, in his op-ed on December 16th, 2021. And now the most dangerous man in the world is put in charge of, of Taiwan affairs. So I think the world needs to know, one, um, who he is and how he rose to power, how he gained trust from CCP leaders. And I think that has not, I think I think we really need to understand that. And second, second of all, some of his ideas. Um, and then lastly, some of his recent moves related to Taiwan. So that's what I will cover today. Um, Wang Huning started his political career in 1994 when he drafted the decision of the fourth plenary session of the 14th CPC Central Committee and played an instrumental role um, in helping Jiang Zemin's rule, in helping Jiang Zemin rule or solidify his rule. Unlike Deng Xiaoping, whose seniority in the party was unchallenged, Jiang Zemin didn't have much political credentials at the time uh, in order to hold on to the number one position within the party. So he tried to establish himself as a new generation of leader with a political vision, which I don't think he had. Um, so he needed a political theorist. His deputy, Zheng Qinghong, th they're all from Shanghai, by the way, uh, you know, Jen Zemin. So Zheng Qinghong recommended the young rising professor at Fudan University. Uh, Fudan University is also is also in Shanghai, right? So he recommended Wang Huning to to Jen Zemin. Uh, by the way, before Jen Zemin, neither Mao Zedong or Deng Xiaoping needed a political theor theorist because they are their own political theorist, right? So by the time Jen Zemin came, you know, they the CCP leaders. All of a sudden, are in need of a uh, are in need of a political theorist to help them come up with a political platform uh, or a political platform. So that just shows you how their their grip on the party uh, or their grip on the ideology has has weakened, or at least during Jiang Zemin's time and 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 um, Hu Jintao's time. So Wang Huning drafted for Jiang the 10,000 word decision, the document is called decision, which officially announced that the handover between the second and the third generation of the central leadership had been completed, which was tantamount to signaling to the world that Jiang Zemin is now the leader and the era of Deng Xiaoping had come to an end. People called this document or decision uh, that Wang drafted 
Jiangzi means declaration of independence after five years of being in Deng Xiaoping's shadow. At the time, it was rumored that Deng Xiaoping was not happy with the key contents of the document, but he was probably too old to do anything about it. Uh, he died. Deng Xiaoping died three years later, less than the less than three years. I think two and a half years later. So that's how Wang Huning gained、uh, Jiang Zemin's faction's trust, and from there he became the political makeup artist for Jiang and later for Hu Jintao. He designed Jiang Zemin's three represents and Hu Jintao's scientific outlook on development. When Xi Jinping came to power, people suspected. That she wouldn't trust Wang because of his、uh, origination with the Jiang Zemin's faction. You know, Jiang, the Jiang faction, the Jiang faction is the biggest political enemy of Xi Jinping. But I think I don't think Xi Jinping had anyone who has Wang's academic background to help him.、Um, but I think there are other reasons that bond the two together, and I'll explain that a little in a little bit. Um, so Xi Jinping's socialist thought, with the Chinese with Chinese characteristics for a new era, is also the brainchild of Wang Huning. So, what what are some of Wang Huning's ideas, and how did he bond? How did he gain Xi Jinping's trust?、Um, many Western scholars know. About Wang's famous book *America Against America*, written thirty years ago, when he was a professor at Fudan, they study his book, trying to understand his thinking. And I think some of the points. Most people say, most people focused on his lack of understanding of America. I want to show you. He actually had a very accurate observation, a very good observation of America at the time. So, so I think that's not picked up by some of the scholars.、Um, just a little background: in 1988, he spent three months at the University of Iowa as a visiting scholar. Then he spent three weeks at UC Berkeley. He visited over he visited over 20 universities across 30 cities. In the U.S., I think spent about six months here. Upon returning to China, he wrote the book *America Against America*. I think the book was finished in 1991. It recorded his observation of the of the U.S.、Um, at the time. I think it was there was a he went through one presidential debate. It was、uh, between、uh, Michael Dukakis and who was who was is that. Is that George Bush Senior?、Um, probably George Bush Senior,、uh, but it was definitely with Michael Dukakis. Okay, so Wang Huning summarized the United States as the place that has an abundance of four C's: C's, cars, calls, computers, and cards. So, in reference to how Chinese people lived their life at the time, he observed. The cars expanded the scope of Americans' living territory or their living space, while telephone broadened their social network. So he noted that America, the American perspective, wasn't limited to their tiny little home space, and and because of because of cars and and telephones, the American perspective is broader、um, in comparison with. The Chinese people's perspective at the time.、Um, he also said that computers could perfectly carry out capitalism ruthlessly without emotions, feelings, or desires. And he said that computers and cards, you know, credit cards, I think, represent a fast and convenient modern life, and their integrated use. Has tokenized social management operation and promoted the credit mechanisms in America. I think these are very astute observations of of American society. I mean, even today, right?、Um, what struck him was the highly commercialized American society, and he acknowledged the advantages of of a market economy, 
and and the advantage from his perspective was, it's less burden on the government, for the government. Um, uh, it's a less burden on the government because the government only needs to regulate the market without having to manage it, because in the in the Chinese excuse me <clears throat> excuse me in the Chinese controlled economy the government not only has to regulate it but also manage it does all the work it, that the here that the private sector handles so he says it's less burden on the government. Um, because the government only needs to worry about regulation, but he believes that the self-governing mechanism of the market of market economy may be harmed by greed. Um, and he said the drive for profit may bring problems um, to the system, um, and the examples are environmental pollution and wealth disparity. He found the American election process as energy and resources. And as resource consuming, but it does solve the problem of power alteration or regime changes. So he does acknowledge that. From his perspective, the lack of emphasis on family or family relations led to American people's loneliness. He also noticed the coldness and the lack of human touch in Western professional settings. And I think this is a very Good observation, and this is actually something that Chinese, a lot of Chinese professionals, are not used to in their initial experience of American professionalism. And he believes that this lack of human connection will harm the United States development and economic competence. One pointed out that the potential crisis in contemporary America are the lack, the breakdown of family. The lost, the lost generation, drug abuse, poverty, racial conflicts, crime organizations, the loss of ethics and morality, and the rising threat coming from Japan.、Uh, he did see that Japan was a threat for the United States at the time in the 1990s. He believes, or he believed, that America will decline due to the emphasis of individual freedom. And over commercialization, I must say he was very sharp in these observations of America, but he had blind spots, which are crucial、uh, in his misjudgment and mistrust of of the West or the United States. And the misjudgment, from my from my perspective, is unavoidable because his entire observation is based on the perspective. Of of a government, not an individual, because his priority is, or, or his job, or his his role as as a scholar, is how to build a good government system that can rule efficiently, that can allow allow the rulers, right, or the leaders, govern efficiently. His goal, he's not coming from the standpoint of. How to help the people in China live a better life, and these scholars, Chinese scholars like him, have treated their study as a means to build a tool that help the dictators or the leaders to better rule. But the United States is not built on the idea of achieving a great government or the perfect government. The purpose of a government is to serve its people. Um, the forefathers of America built a political system to ensure the happiness of its people, and this is the point that Wang Huning and many Chinese scholars missed. And I don't think a lot of the Western observers have picked up this point. And this is the very reason why Chinese scholars or many Chinese scholars and politicians do not and cannot understand American political systems or America. Because their perspective is always, how do I build a government that help me, that helps me better rule? Unfortunately,、um, every problem he described in the book has hit China to a much worse degree today. And there, and Xi Jinping and Wang Huning's understanding of the causes of China's problems is what bonds them together. 
Xi Jinping and Wang Huning are both men of ide ideological faith. They both believe that the over-commercialization has destroyed the moral fabric of China and eroded the society. They both believe that Western capitalist influence and its money has caused the massive corruption in China. This is the view that bond them together and made Xi Jinping trust Wang Huning despite his origin with the Jiang faction. I think because they're both men of ideological faith and they, they truly believe in that and this is what uh, make them trust each other. However, Wang's views written in the book was his ideas 30 years ago. I don't think his, ide his ideological faith has changed, but some of the views written in the book might have changed because I don't think he is the same person that he was 30 years ago. For example, he was often described as a quiet, extremely low-key person who was reluctant to even join politics initially because he enjoyed teaching his teaching job as a professor. But in recent years, he has been seen as displaying enthusiastic support to Xi Jinping in public. And this is very different from his personality. Actually, I have pictures. I have forgot about my slides. Sorry, um, here we go. Oh, there, there's him, um, yeah. So he's always a quiet observer. This is him in his younger years as a, as a young professor in China, uh, wearing a Mao uniform. Um, th this is the article that the, the col columnist from Washington Post referred to. Um, it, it's very long, but it's worth reading. Oh, this is what I want to talk about. Yes, so this this picture was taken. I, I did a screenshot. This was the moment when the MC announced that Xi Jinping will be sworn in as the president of China. So this was like the second after the announcement was made and Xi Jinping stepped away from his chair and was walking to the podium to be sworn in. Take a look at who was the per who was the person who raised his hands to applaud him first before everyone else. It's no other than Wang Huning, right? While all the other, it was like instantly he raised his hands to applaud Xi Jinping, while all other officials. I mean, these people are all very loyal to him, and they they used the opportunity to show their loyalty and devotion to Xi Jinping. So they would all want to raise their hands. But who did it? Who was the fastest? It was Wang Huning. So this was, what, two days ago at the um, two sessions. And then this was in 2021 at the, uh, this was a performance, a, a concert, or maybe a, yeah, a musical performance given to celebrate the centennial anniversary of the CCP. It was in July 2021. Uh, as Xi Jinping was intro being introduced and acknowledging the, the crowd, look at who turned around to give him his eye contact. I mean, there are other people like Han Zhen, you know, on the far left also, you know, turned. But who left his position and turned all the way to give his acknowledgement to Xi Jinping? Again, it was Wang Huning. Take a look at Li Keqiang and all the people... On the right, I mean, they they look Li Keqiang looked like he was falling asleep, but Wang Huning is different. My point is, he's different now. He is no longer, um, he's no longer the the extremely low key professor who do not want to review his thoughts and ideas in public anymore. Um, he has been publicly showing his devotion to Xi Jinping, but there are also uh, there's another interpretation saying that he purposely does this to to gain Xi Jinping's support. Maybe it's done. Maybe it's done for show. But regardless, I don't think after thirty years he is the same person anymore because CCP's politics can change a person. 
Now, I also don't think we should overemphasize his ability in coming up with anything for for Xi Jinping or for Taiwan. His political theories may impress CCP officials, but not the outside world. I don't think anyone, any serious scholars, are impressed with three represents or Xi Jinping's thoughts, or Hu Jintao's scientific development outlook. No matter how the chief political makeup artist dress up a Taiwan solution or dresses up a Taiwan solution, people will see right through it. However, his appointment by Xi Jinping has revealed that she isn't totally confident in a military takeover yet. He will have to rely on other means <clears throat> to achieve his goal. And therefore, I think Taiwan and the outside world should um, monitor moves by, by Wang Huning because they might very well re-strategize. So what has Wang Huning been doing now, right? So that brings us to the next question. So first, he is focusing on the Taiwan election with the goal to help the Kuomintang to win. Of course, he's not going out of his way to, to do that overtly. He's doing that covertly because if they let the Taiwanese voters know who they want to win, it may achieve the opposite result. In February, Wang Huning received a Kuomintang delegation headed by the VP, uh, Xia Liyan, in Beijing. And Wang said, he said, the most urgent task is to resume the normalization of cross-strait exchanges as soon as possible. This quote reveals Xi Jinping's sense of urgency, right? The most urgent task is the normalization of the relations as soon as possible. So Xi Jinping does feel a sense of urgency to come up with another means um, that's conducive to his military operation. And, and also this normalization of cross-strait relation will be the main theme that Wang Huni will use to help the Kuomintang win the election while attribute the tension and hostility across the strait to DPP and the United States. So I think that's his, his plan. He may not issue a lot of, he may not do a lot of moves, but he would definitely, the, the, the Taiwan election would definitely be his top priority. And secondly, I think he has started a legal warfare. You know, the, the unrestricted warfare has many subsets, and one of them is legal warfare. China's new foreign minister, Qin Gang, surprisingly brought a copy of China's constitution with him at his first press conference. I have a picture of that, I think. There, there we go. Um, this surprised many people because CCP spokesperson or diplomats don't they don't do that, right? But this this new prime minister, a new foreign minister, brought a copy of the constitution with him, and holding it in his hand, he warned the U.S. and demanded the U.S. to explain its plans for quote the destruction of Taiwan. So he accused Taiwan with a plan to destroy Taiwan, but he demanded it, it, he demanded the United States to explain his plan. Western analysts interpreted his reference to the Constitution as an unusual gesture to, to emphasize CCP's determination for reunification, but I think it's a sign that the CCP is starting a, le a, a um, what do you call that? A, a legal warfare, a law warfare, meaning using law as a weapon in its in in attacking its opponent, and it may be the brainchild of Wang Huning. China's foreign relations with the West is sp is spiraling downward, and one knows that the Westerners. Western societies have a high respect for rule of law and a confrontation with the West in the name of defending its law or its constitution will give the CCP the, a great um, cause for, to fight, right? It will serve its domestic audiences and make Western countries work harder to justify its action 
concerning Taiwan. So it's just using law as a means to justify its 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 unification, and in the name of law, you know, fighting the West in the name of law will make the West work harder or more difficult to combat the CCP because the West generally respect law. And another example that makes me say that this is one of the new strategies that CCP came up with or Wang Huning came up with is recently at these at the CC at the two sessions, an internet right internet writer by the name of Zhou Xiaoping. I do have a picture of him. And this this is a this is a Chinese you call him an internet writer, but Chinese call him a a big Wu Mao, right? Because he is writing to glorify the party. So this guy proposed a motion to enact a blacklist of Taiwan separatists for disciplinary purpose. And he said that during, quote, he, he said during special operations against Taiwan, he didn't use attack, he didn't use war, he used special military operations or special operations against Taiwan. He said anyone can arrest or kill or open fire on these individuals, meaning the separatists, the Taiwan separatists, on the list, uh, who are identified on the list, and be awarded for a Medal of Honor for having promoted Taiwan unification. Such a terrorist proposal has been accepted by the regime and is now being reviewed for approval. Now, this this guy is, um, this internet writer, Zhou Xiaoping, has been elected, yeah, used the word elected as a delegate in the CCP, in, in Wang Huning's organization, I think for, for the first time. And I think this whole, this whole episode of having a uh, infamous Wu Mao personality proposing such a outrageous law at the two sessions is a designed publicity to instigate fear among Taiwanese voter. Um, because Zhou Xiaoping is, is, has, a, has a notoriety, I and mean, a lot of Chinese don't really respect him. He, he, um, he was famous for, for his effort to show loyalty years ago when he got married. He posted his wedding picture on the internet uh, with, with, with the words saying, I mean, he pledged his vow to his bride by saying, <laughs> he, he pledged his vow to the party and his bride by saying that I gave my body to the party and I gave my heart to you. And he was so badly ridiculed in China and because Chinese netizens say you are, um, by giving your body to your party, you're not faithful to your bride. And by giving your heart to your bride, you're not faithful to the party. So this guy has, you know, people, people ridicule him so badly. So the whole the whole reason why they chose this person to propose this outrageous law is for the purpose of publicity. Um, other works that I think one has spearheaded, including, or his department has spearheaded, including spreading rumors designed to weaken the Taiwan-US relations before the election, Recently, narratives such as the TSMC, the Ta Taiwan Semiconductor Company, uh, T TSMC's investment in the United States will empty out resources in Taiwan. Rumors such as U.S. officials have having taken over the Taiwanese government. Uh, the U.S. dignitaries kept visiting Taiwan in order to sell Boeing airplanes, um, so on and so forth. And so these narratives are being spread in Taiwan with the goal to to sow discord between U.S. and 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 Taiwan, or to generate distrust among Taiwanese voters um, against the United States. So, so in summary, so what does this mean to to the Taiwan situation? 
I I think we need to keep a close eye on what he's up to, but I think he shouldn't be overemphasized because as you hopefully you've seen his his ideas, his his work only appeals to Xi Jinping and Jiang Zemin and those CCP leaders. There are not anything that's terribly impressive to the outside world. And people say, what think about what can he come up with to replace one country, two systems to 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 convince the Taiwanese people? It's just mission impossible. And also some of China observers say that Wang Huning is the biggest reason why Xi Jinping has failed as the fifth generation leader. Because when Xi Jinping first started uh, with Li Keqiang more than 10 years ago, Chinese people put a lot of hope in him, in the, in the Xi Li team or the ticket, shall we say. But thanks to Wang Huning's advices and ideas, Xi Jinping has failed miserably. His belt, look at Belt and Road Initiative, the China Dream, his wolf warrior approach, the concept of East Rises and West Falls, all of that have failed miserably. So maybe whatever Wang Huning comes up with will be another failure. So it may not be a bad thing. Um, but with that said, I don't think we should just slack off. We should be diligent in watching what he's up to. Um, but it can be fun watching what he come up with again with another great name. Um, all right, so that wraps up my presentation. I hope this is helpful. Okay, so let me see what people have for me, questions-wise. All right. All right. A question from Les. Lei, does the CCP really care about the Chinese people? No. It only cares about its, its regime. Um, let me see. I mean, do you have any questions? Okay, from Greg Anderson, Lei, China sold Taiwan to Japan a long time ago. Japan lost in World War II, so Taiwan was given back to the Taiwan people. How can China claim Taiwan after they sold it? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Some, some legal experts argue that uh, when the Qin dynasty, Qin, when the Qin dynasty dissolved itself, it rescinded to the power of the Republic, the people's, um, not the people, the Chi the Republic of China. It, it legitimizes the Republic of China, meaning the, the government in Taiwan as the, the 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 political the 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 government that rule China, and so from that perspective, the Republic of China is the legitimate heir of this. Um, what do you call that? A lines of you know a political lines of inheritance. I don't know what do you call that. So CCP just is, you know, its rule isn't legitimate. I haven't really looked deep into that, but I think that that's a very interesting thought. So you do have a point. Thank you, Travel with Love. Thank you. Happy Sunday. And thank you, Van Kat. All right. And from Zhang Do, is the Taiwanese owner of the Brooklyn Nets a member of the CPC? I'm not sure. Uh, I need to look into that, but that's thank you for the question. From Laura, nobody's talking about the demographics yet, the diminishing population of China. It is happening. I want to talk about it. Someone mentioned that there was there was a reduction of 400 million travels or trips or, or person slash travels during the Lunar New Year a month ago. Um, and that's a sign of a drastic reduction in total population in China. And I think that's right. And someone came up with an analysis a day ago and said that based on their calculation, there is a reduction of 400 million people in China 
just by comparing Beijing's own number now versus before the pandemic. So it is it is a it is a big challenge, but CCP is hiding it. From Dave M, the CCP may support the KMT, but do you think both parties want to keep the status quo, not declaring independence? Yes, I don't think the K the DTP wants to declare independence either. And I think the and I think the CCP's effort to infiltrate infiltrate Taiwan applies to both party. You cannot assume that DPP is not subject to infiltration. Or influence, it's it's both. Um, from Courtney Donovan Smith. Hi, Courtney. Thank you for joining me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, agree with your assessment on the campaign strategy of the Kuomintang and CCP's role in it. Wrote on this recently. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for sharing your ideas. From twelve, CCP hides every every hides everything. Yeah. All right. So if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to start my weekend <laughs> because I worked all day yesterday on this on this episode. But I quite enjoy the research process because I, I learned so much and I uh, found a lot a lot of interesting things. So. All right. So enjoy the rest of your weekend and I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.